The hills of the southern Appalachians have sustained travelers and settlers for centuries. These forests have provided food, shelter, safety, and inspiration for the people who have lived here and for those who are just passing through. Things made by hand have always been a part of this region's tradition. Furniture for the home, carved and woven from wood close by. Decorative clothing and blankets made with many hands and wooden materials hewn to provide shelter and warmth from the mountain winters, all bear the marks of human hands on natural materials. Formed, carved, or woven, these objects have expressed our humanity, our individuality, and our cultural heritage. They have often revealed those areas of life that we value the most and have become treasures to be passed down from one generation to the next. The same is true today. In the spring of 2003, David Nash, one of the leading wood sculptors in the world, came to the North Carolina mountains to spend a month working with aspiring artists from four North Carolina universities. This residency was sponsored and coordinated by the Center for Craft Creativity and Design, a research center of the University of North Carolina. This was indeed a once-in-a-lifetime experience for the students selected to be a part of this project. They told some other people that they got to come and I didn't hear anything about it. And I was like, oh, I didn't get it. And I was, I was like, why didn't I get it? I really wanted to go. They should let people go if they want to go. And uh, then one of my teachers stopped me in the hall. She's like, so are you excited? I'm like, excited about what? She's like, David Ashley, and I like jumped up and down and screamed. I was so happy. I was like, yeah, <laughs> this is great. They laughed at me. <laughs> they laughed a lot. I'm real excited about it. I think it's great. <laughs> what kind of person could generate this level of excitement? David Nash is one of the most prolific sculptors of our time. He is credited with more than a thousand works, mostly in wood, that are in major collections and museums around the world. Nash was born in Surrey, England in 1945. He grew up in a family where the values of hard work, practical living, and productivity were emphasized. The young Nash, who had a natural ability to draw and paint, was attracted to the visual arts and started on the path to learn the tools of the trade. Being an art student in the 60s was just great three years, well, initial foundation year, which you're trying, every, everything was usually the most exciting of all, and then getting into a, into a three-year course, and um, at the end, end, end of that, an and, and exhibition. And it was during that period that I realized that the people in the year ahead of me, when they're in their third year, they're spending all their time applying for what would be the equivalent of MA courses and they weren't really being able to focus on their on their work for their for their exhibition and after I decided I wouldn't apply straight away I'd leave it for a year or two years and in the meantime I went to North Wales where I knew I could live very very cheaply and I actually managed to buy a little cottage for just 300 pounds and then eventually couple of roof for, for just 200 pounds enormous building and then I did apply to the to the Chelsea School of Art to do what would now be an MA year, and it was the best thing that I could have done to have to have had that space and to have been on my own. That's partly why I went up there to, just to be remote, hidden, no other artists around, just to find out whether I was really up to doing this, and and I, I seems like I am. I didn't mean to stay in North Wales. That wasn't my intention, but. Um, it was a once, 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 once you got a, a building and, you, and, you've, and you're starting putting, putting roots down. And married Claire and, and, raised, and raised our kids there. Nash's intense dedication and commitment to his work are evidenced by the quantity and quality of what he has produced. He is well known for his earthworks, environmental sculpture, and installations. These pieces were created not for their commercial potential, but as an expression of what the artist deeply believes is important. A sculpture for me has a more of a beginning than an end. The end 
is through a passage of time. But really, as sculptors, we're engaging physical space and time. So it's, a, it's not just a three-dimensional art, it's a four-dimensional art. And particularly for outdoor work, uh, the two prime experiments I've been making is the ash dome and the wooden boulder. Uh, these are pieces which are engaging the natural they're engaging the natural elements and they're not trying to resist them. And I noticed as a student that a, there was very little outdoor sculpture that I really liked and it was a mystery to me why that was. And I've realized it was mainly, mostly because there has to be quite a lot of aggression in resisting the elements. It had to be maintained all the time. And if they weren't maintained, they, they kind of looked bad. They looked old and dead. So my question was, how do, I have, how do I make an outdoor sculpture then which engages actively with what's happening in that particular site? So with the ash dome, the simple planting of trees, small trees which are going to grow, you know, I had to anticipate them growing and being able to grow a space. And with the wooden holder, it, that's on the other side of the cycle of wood from the ash dome. The ash dome is growing and the wooden boulder is going. But both of them are engaging the realities of their particular time and space. So the wooden boulder is continually fresh. It's 25 years old now, but it's, it's, it's active. And I just started it. I didn't know what was going to really happen, happen with it, but, I, but my, the concept of the idea was to launch this lump of wood which initially I was going to take into my studio, but when through the circumstance of it getting jammed halfway down this waterfall, I was moving it down to the road, um, I realized that this was where it could belong and live, and over a period of time I could get it down to, to, to the road. And then that became the whole point of the piece. It was in the stream. And it's only a lump of wood, and it's, a, it's, a, it's the least skillfully carved piece of wood that you could Im imagine. There's no artistry in the, in the carving of it. Really. All it had to be was roundish to get a sense of a sphere. So it's not a, by no means is it a, did I try attempt to make a perfect sphere. And the piece wouldn't be the same if it was. It's got to be this in this sort of in-between stage of it only just being touched. It's sort of, it's next to nothing. But, in, but the whole something of it is its, is its movement and its engagement with, with, with the elements. And, and now it's in, in, in the estuary. It's moving all the time. But for 24 years, it was in, ni in nine different places, but with a very dramatic movement at, at a, you know, over a very short period of time. Just, uh, just five or ten minutes was when, when, when they moved down the little stream. But then it was very sedentary. It was just, it became a fixed object and I would visit it with, with visitors who would come to see my uh, work and it was on the circuit of my showing them my studios and the outdoor pieces. The artist began the creative process by the shaping, curving, bending and molding what nature ultimately will finish. In these imaginative works, the human spirit has truly been blended with the natural forces of our environment. Nash has always had a strong interest in education. No doubt, this was one factor that drew him to the North Carolina residency. It seems to me that the general opinion of teaching is that you have a young person there, like a, a young child, who doesn't know anything. And you've got to, you've got to stuff things in them, into the space, and for them to, for them to remember it, and try and find techniques for them to, to to uh, remember it and test them. Another, uh, the attitude that I find far more sympathetic and true is that we are born with everything and we learn by recognizing what we have inside us outside, but you can't learn it consciously or can't come into your mind until you see what you have inside you, outside you. So a teacher's real role is to give the child appropriate experiences of which they could recognize. And it's the same with art that I find that people like something of mine because they're recognizing something which is, which is within themselves. So that's what, 
you know, when we discuss originality, and that the word tends to be associated with innovation and invention. So it's like my idea is that I invented this, so I claim this idea as mine. But, but for me, a, a, a rig, originality means origin and being intimately connected with origin, or you find a path to a sense of origin, which is a truth to us, to us all. And our role of artists is to keep fresh this sense of origin, this, or these great, what the great source of idea of, of being, and, and experience of being, of being a human being and learning about ourselves, because we are an instrument of self-learning is what makes a human being unique. So this hard-working artist from Wales came to the North Carolina mountains to work with a group of artists as green as the saplings in the ash dome. The residency took place at the Pinland School of Kratz, a secluded refuge located north of Asheville where artists have come for years for renewal, exploration, and growth. It was an ideal setting for the residency. It's actually you know, the physicality of the material. And it's, for me, the only way to plug into a place is to touch the stuff of the place. The, it's, um, it's a way of engaging with the elemental forces of I'll make a note of that and try and explain what I mean by that. And they manifest themselves subtly different in each part of the world and in each location. So, with his strong um, presence, he began to introduce the students to his way of working, thinking and creating. The Nash Residency was indeed both a physical and intellectual experience for all involved. He clearly spelled out what was expected from each student and faculty member and how he or she would participate in this creative process. Nash also made it clear that videographers and producers were not an important part of this experience. We were to become part of the woodwork, stay out of the way and become invisible. Fortunately for us, as time progressed, David became more involved and interested in the video project and has made an invaluable contribution to our creative process. Perhaps because we quickly recognized that the paramount priority for Nash, as always, was the work that was before him and the students. Tony Lamar, the well-known North Carolina woodcarver, served as an assistant to Nash during the residency. He too was influenced deeply by this intense man from Wales. The first thing he does with a group of kids is to engage their physical body. And, uh, uh, and, it, and that was very, very evident in that three-week period, I mean, uh, in terms of just getting to start stripping bark. I'm sure some of those kids are like, you know, what in the world are we doing this for? Uh, but for him, it was, you know, uh, getting their, getting the flow, you know, um, uh, the blood going, and, the, and you know, and, and getting them in just just involved and using their bodies. And then the, um, the, the 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 rhythm body for me was the one that I that has has had the most effect on me because as a wood sculptor. Uh, and particularly as a wood sculptor that is, for the most part, developed work on the lathe, rhythm is, is very much a part of, of, uh, of what I do, and it's become a part of what I make. And when he started talking about the rhythm body, then engaging that, that part of yourself that's about rhythm, about you know, getting up, having breakfast, going to work, having lunch at a certain period, uh, that sort of 
movement through the day and, and developing a rhythm around that movement uh, really, really spoke to me. And then it's what really started to make sense to me as far as, as, far as the rhythm body was concerned was, particularly as a woodworker, uh, is that as if a material, wood uh, has a rhythm to it. It has, a, you know, a, a, there you, as you develop a relationship, as I've developed a relationship with this material, I've recognized that that spring, summer, fall, winter, spring, summer, fall, winter, that the rhythm within the material really affects uh, uh, how I approach different, different uh, species within the material as well as how I approach the work. The work site came alive in a hurry. Each person had a job and immediately went to work. The creative process began with a flurry of activity in a dozen different directions at the same time. Um, as a student, I was always I found myself being very anxious about the finish of a piece and knowing when was it finished. And I kind of always liked it when it was in a quite a, in a raw state and the finishing seemed to kill it off. So I that sort of led me towards realizing that it was important to how you started a piece and that how it went on was very much conditioned by how you started it. So the most important thing for me is the activity of making of the actual processes and the activity and if you're working with a group of students that includes root the uh, routine and the, the social dynamic, the feeling body of the, of the site where you can get some humor working and um, we're sort of in con verbal contact with each other but we must keep the whole flow of work going and then there's the thinking aspect of which is in, which is in the seminar. But those seminars only really work when the students have really got physically engaged with, with, the, with, with, with the act of making this, this group of work. Everyone here just kind of is like a big family. It's very communal. We all eat dinner, breakfast, and lunch together. And everyone's always smiling and doing community activities. And we all have a common interest, which is art. And it's just... It's amazing to see so many people interested in not the same thing, but like the, I don't know. You can be as weird as you want and nobody really <laughs> looks at you strangely, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you can be as out there as you need to be. Yeah. It's just normal here. It's great. It's awesome. <laughs> and the food's amazing. Yeah, the Amazing food, awesome. food. It's like vegetarian paradise. Oh. Yeah, David's got like 20 different projects going on at one time and so we're helping to prepare for this project, helping during the process of this project, helping finishing up this project and just like bouncing around from one thing to the next thing. It keeps things interesting. Not only seeing his work is always rewarding because it's amazing. But getting to talk and like hold conversations and hear him lecture and stuff is the most rewarding by far. He sums things up into like categories. He like yeah. breaks things down and simplifies things and just puts like the whole art world into perspective and making it as an artist and, and how that affects you as a person and your goals in life. And it's really great. It's just amazing. Like it's and great. And he does these drawings on the drawings on the board. <laughs> And it's just like three or four drawings on top of one another. He's he like, just, he gets so prepared. excited. Like he, he's just like going from the top of his head and it's kind of like picking his brain and you can see him thinking in the process and it's really cool. He's an amazing person to talk to. The students were influenced in different ways by Nash. They were astounded by his energy, productivity, and zeal, and the work ethic he demonstrated. The other aspect, particularly I'm trying to get to them, is the amount of preparation that you need to be spontaneous. Spontaneity isn't, doesn't, you have to actually have 
equipment, a space, time, a free mind not to be bothered by, by other things, to be really spont uh, spontaneous. And also try to work very much about ideas. I, I don't teach chainsaw and I don't teach skills of a chainsaw, the, the, the actual, I don't teach practical skills. It's, it's the skills of how you work on your own being uh, to, to find yourself, to find your particular way, or the students to help them find their particular nature and what suits them, what, what methods, what, what materials and what, what ideas uh, match their own makeup. So we've only got a three days, so I'm not imagining I'm going to achieve this in any, to a, a very conscious degree for them, but uh, it's the speed and the activity and the routine which gets them into this work site. And the work site really is speaking at them. He's reworking similar, similar things over and over again. And each time he re reworks them, there's something new found and, and something's gained and it's, it's a whole evolution of thought. And, and I deal with really similar things. So, so it's been neat to see how somebody who's maybe dealing with similar ideas, how his brain handles, handles that compared to how I know mine does. I think really all he wanted us to do is move all this stuff so that he could get the, uh, the loader. We had a, a whole tree had, was offered to me in September. 2002 when I came on a preliminary visit which included, uh, it was standing, so I asked if they could keep all the brushwood, the trunks and the brushwood, because uh, there was, I felt, yeah, I'm imagining a group of four students, what am I actually going to get them to, to do so they can all quite quickly get hands on. So we started with the brushwood piles and spread them out, you know, to find useful shapes in the brushwood like a slingshot, which is a really sort of a geometry, a vertical and a two, and a triangle. Um, the other object, a useful object, is a shillelagh, which is, uh, so this is cut from brushwood so there's like a club like bit with a handle and when you pick that up you've got a feeling of it being a, a hitting or a, or a or a hooking tool and the other thing we I got them to look for is just these these shapes of which there are many in any tree because they the tree is always dividing to get more light its whole object practical object is to divide as much as possible to get to the greatest leaf area that it can um, so that sort of really got them hands-on with lots of objects. So it was very, it was very loose. Then we started to tighten up by making them into certain lengths. These uh, slingshot pieces, for example. And then all these Vs had to be sorted out into from large to small <coughs> through about ten different grades. And then building a form which in itself is tight, it's just a, like a pyramid out of V's, but so the, the actual method of pining is very loose, but the, the, the shape is tight. And it's like the um, black dome that I was intending to, to make a simple form. And it only works with it when it does, when the tops of these do, of these pieces meet that arc. It's made of 91 pieces and is very loose, but the form is very tight. So, so that was a theme that was running through, and it's a theme that runs through all my work.
I've known for a long time about fence posts here in the States on the east side. Locust is the best wood. And also the charring of the, of the end helps to preserve it as well. So uh, I look for wood I can make outdoor sculptures with because it's useless making it with birch or with a wood which will rot very quickly outside. So I'll, for outdoor sculptures, I'll only use wood that I'm confident and I've seen demonstrated. So I've seen locust posts and split rail fences here to be confident that this is a wood I can confidently make an outdoor work with. When I was making, first making wood sculptures, I just, what, asked, if asked what, what material do I use, I say, well, I'm working with uh, wood. And these were just uh, planks and beams I was getting from, from uh, the demolition sites. And then when I, did, I didn't have access to, to that anymore, I, the only wood that was around was fallen, fallen trees, trees. And I've been taught at art school, you must not use unseasoned wood because it cracks and bends and warps, but I wanted to make. So I just got some of, this, or some of these limbs and sure enough they did crack, bend and warp and I just found that was fantastic. And then I realised I was working with not just wood but where the wood came from, which is a tree. And I was looking at trees and studying different types of trees, like the oakness of oak, which I was experiencing by carving only by, only by hand. I didn't have a I didn't have a chainsaw for 10, for 10 years. It was all hand tools. When you carve oak, it really bites back at you. It's got a lot of resistance. But if you carve lime, it's a very soft, a very yielding wood. So you get a very different experience from that. So I really learned the languages or the dialects of these different woods by hand tools. So the chainsaw makes every bit of wood pretty much the same. Then looking more into the tree and looking at living trees and realizing how to, when I started planting trees, how the trees are a weave of the four elements. The, 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 the trees are seeded in, in, the, in the earth, which is full of minerals. That's the world of matter and solids. And it needs light and warmth, which is, which is the fire element. And it obviously needs water and it, and it needs air. So I realise that wood is a very balanced amalgam of these four elemental forces. When I was at school, <coughs> 14, you know, we did a, our history subject was uh, medieval. It was medieval history and uh, I remember the our teacher telling us about the four elements and about how the alchemists were working with <coughs> earth, air, fire, water. And I never heard this before, and I was really thrilled. I, can remember the ex I still remember the excitement of hearing about these four elements. And then he said, but, there, but of course we don't believe in that anymore. And I felt this huge sense of disappointment. <laughs> That's all within the space of two minutes. But that recognition that was offered to me, um, or I heard this and I'd sparked up to it, I'd recognise it has really sort of lived, lived with me. It's been, and working more and more with it and thinking more, more about it and reading other people's research and perceptions of these four elements, I feel that I've gone a lot more, a lot deeper than the more superficial and rather new age, the sort of new age has hijacked the, the four ele elements. I used to use them in my letterhead to a point where I thought it just made me look like a hippie. So um, I, I dropped this picture of a tree with the words earth, air, fire, fire, water, and I adopted the um, cube sphere pyramid as my sort of badge on my, on my letterhead. Freedom is really what it's about. We represent freedom. That's why people want artists are quite envious of artists. Uh, they assume artists behave badly because they're free. You know. But that, well, that's that's sort of an old idea of of the wild beast artist. It's 
I think artists now have far more social conscience than they've ever had before. The, 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 uh, the, the truth of a, of a work now is paramount right, over, over, over how skillfully it's made or its, its craftsmanship or how well it looks. It's the truth of the idea is paramount for us now. Because we are guardians of truth and finders of truth. Art is trying to understand the truth and trying to find different ways of creatively explaining how many ways there are to see what truth is. And so therefore you're, you're constantly experimenting with something that, that is tactile, uh, visceral, visual, uh, smells. You know, it, it, you can take any aspect of light. You, you can take math. And you can throw it out in the most creative aspect, and what you're going to end up with is uh, an aspect of art. You know, as long as you're you're diving into what what are the options life gives you. You know, hearing the things that he's been through, and and you know, he was once our age and young and had ideas, and and now he's where he is, and things are really solid in him. You know, he really knows what he's doing and where he's at and but he's still learning and and you can see that he's still open to things changing and he's just he's a good person to be around when i'm soaring there's a you know, there's a focus obviously with these very thin cuts you've got to be very focused but there is it's very rhythmic and quite meditative really and i have a lot of time to think and after having met the students and slept on it, and I began to get a feeling of who they are and what they might be, what might be useful to them. Sometimes it's in the individually, and some, or sometimes I prepare the seminar in the, in, the, in, uh, in the evening. And in a way, the seminar is being based around these inherent qualities, but also about this great poem that Muhammad Ali spoke, uh, said, it's the shortest poem in the English language. It's me, we. And me is the, what you have to develop as uh, an individual. And then the we is you living with everyone else. And it's something that an artist needs to develop those two aspects of one's being. You're a social being, as well as being an individual. Being, you represent individuality and freedom. But you also are in a social dynamic. Some people are so social, they don't give enough time for themselves. And some people are so ego-centered, they don't give any time or awareness or empathy to any, anyone else. So that's part of, or a main aspect of really what these seminars have been about. Um, well, the, the maintenance crew here, for example, they've, they all work with wood. Like most Americans, they, in their family, they, they are woodworkers. And there's like the regular things that you do with wood. And there are certain skills that you do them with. So I'm using exactly the same skills, same common material, but I'm doing something a little different from it. So that's, so people can feel their way into what I'm doing because they've already got this common language with them. But what makes it different is that it is different. And, it's, and that's what one is partly working with. You're working with the expectation of other people, what they expect as a status quo. But you can just move it a bit. And it can freshen what they know uh, by presenting an, an uh, alternative way of looking at it. I think artists move laterally in, in their minds. Um, it's very near comedy. I mean, humor's terribly important in it. Not to make a joke, but the, what, how humor works is that you set someone up when you tell a joke, you set someone up with an expectation, then you give them another, uh, the punchline is something you're not expecting. And that's, it's very satisfying, makes you laugh. And I think art is like that too, it, is, it satisfies you in some way. It might not make you laugh, but it might satisfy something quite, you know, in a, quite a, in a deeper, profounder, thoughtful way. Spring weather in the mountains is unpredictable at best. The students in the residency experience the full range of climatic challenges. But in spite of the cold, wet and snow, spirits remained high. But 
You know, uh, David, he, 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 he's always expressing to us uh, um, pulling from the elements and, and what, what's he saying? He, he looks for the inherent qualities. The inherent qualities, in, yeah. And the materials and the elements he's working with. So, so when it snowed, we just piled some snow up and made a, a snow stove. Um, he does various stoves. We, we were blessed with the opportunity, I guess, so yeah. it's snowing and yeah. it's getting to make one. Yeah, I guarantee that, that we'll be the only group of students who, who saw that, you know. And um, so that kind of sets us on top of everybody else. <laughs> yeah, the weather was, was very unsettled, but that apparently is, well, I'm used to that. Where I, where I live, you get all weathers in one day in Blino Festinio. And when it snowed, it seemed, there seemed like an automatic closing down of, of the project in the so students felt that they couldn't be working because it's snowing and I immediately thought of a boy I've got people or we've got snow let's make a snow stove and it wasn't this wasn't in my plan for this show at all but it was an, it's all in a way demonstrating to them here is a suddenly an unexpected circumstance that you can use that you work with instead of it stopping you you can do something The idea of making a stove in wood is kind of ironical. And to have a picture of a, a fashioned a, a log with a hole drilled through it and the sawn out hearth and the on fire with smoke coming out, out, out of it. And then exhibit that with a photograph of it. But, there were, but when I did it, it didn't really work there, but the actual event of making the stove was much more interesting. <laughs> so I really also realized that this is, it suited the idea much more to be ephemeral to be a very short-lived time, but it's something that the human being has done all over the world, is to gather material to make a fire, to, to, make, to uh, cook a food, and to, and to, and to sleep round. Um, so this gathering of the material of the space, of that particular place, like in the Bees Boss in, in, in Holland, you have very wet soil, willow trees with lots of willow sticks fallen, so it was a, it was a wet clay and stick stove, which I built lit and photographed. So the photograph is, is the piece. I did an ice stove in, in Japan uh, on the frozen sea. We um, chopped blocks of ice and built up a, a form, a, a stove. It's like a little temple, like a little building and uh, lit a fire in it. So in that case you have the, you have the elements in visual communication or uh, contrast to each other, like hot, cold, wet, dry. I did a piece on the slate tip behind us again. It's just gathering the slate of that particular place. And I actually found enough bits of wood around to, of that place too to light, to light the fire. There's a river stove, which is in the same river stream as the wooden <laughs> polder. And in that image, what, what I found thrilling was the upward movement of the fire and the downward movement of, of the water, there are these two elements passing each other, which, are, which are, sort of extinguish each other normally. But this was just a moment. So they, they're a gathering of the material of the circumstances and, and the realities of that particular spot. And by lighting a fire, you, you magnify the moment. Many of Nash's pieces were partially charred. This was done by placing the work in a fire, building a fire around it, or by using a torch or a branding iron. The act of burning was controlled by the artist, selecting which areas were to be burned and for how long. Using fire as a chisel or brush is an important tool in Nash's creative arsenal. Well, earth, air, fire, water. This is the heat element. And this is, uh, we all burn wood. Uh, mankind has been burning wood since we've been a sentient being. So um, it also gives me another color. It can, it can exaggerate uh, the depth of a uh, space. Like for, with Californian redwood, for example, I have the red, and then if it's partly charred, I have the black, so I can, I can combine these two forces. It's not just a black color, it's carbon. It's been, the surface has been transformed from wood to carbon. So, you're not, so this here is wood experience, and that's carbon experience. So 
So when it's all black, you're no longer having a wood sculpture experience. It's a carbon piece. Completely different realm of in terms of time and emotion. I was there at one point where uh, he was burning one of the pieces. And uh, he had set one of the young men uh, out to do it. And I had shown him what he wanted. And, and David, of course, had three or four different pieces going at the same time. So he went to work on one of the other pieces. And he went over to look at what was going on with the young, you know, with the burning. And it had gone too far. And uh, didn't have a hose there. And, uh, you know, get the hose, get the hose. You know, it's gone too far, it's gone too far. And, uh, um, I walked over to it, and uh, uh, he was looking at it, and he's like, well, you messed it up, Stoney, we messed it up. And uh, he walked away and picked up his chainsaw. And uh, uh, um, then about 10 minutes later, he went back over to the, uh, this young man, and he said, uh, I want you to understand that you are doing exactly what I asked you to do, and that it's not your fault. And you, you could just see the kid just okay you know uh, and I it, you know that that story circulated you know it was it was very typical of his approach one of the facts of this project is I've met staff from the universities who are, who are iron pourers and they've been very keen that I should have a go and I am looking for other materials I could I can uh, work from the ideas I found out of wood which don't necessarily have to be interpreted in wood they could be in other in other ma other materials so this is an opportunity for me and they're going to we're going to do an iron pour here. So I've made wood molds for them. And uh, the first group took a small piece back to make a, a, a mold from, which will be poured. And I've also made some glass pieces here. So again, using Penland, Penland, what the fact of Penland is. It's, and we were, one is very welcomed into the, into the different uh, media studios. These guys are excited. These guys are excited because we've got more men than we The iron casting of some of David Nash's pieces became a major event on the University of North Carolina Asheville's campus. Art students, faculty members, and patrons all gathered to watch this rather medieval event that seemed to transport the observers back to a more primitive time. Old radiators were shattered and dumped into a fiery cauldron to be transformed into works of art. Under the watchful eye of Dan Millspaw, UNCA's lead sculptor, the student assistants carried out their duties in preparing the poor. The Nash pieces were actually designed and created in wood to be later cast in iron. Wooden molds were used for some works that resulted in richly textured surfaces when the molten metal came in contact with the molds. Others would be made from sand molds formed from the wooden originals that would ultimately be cast in iron. The excitement continued to build as darkness fell, and the moment of the big pour arrived. The resulting inferno was spectacular. Well, a great piece of art isn't going to work for everybody as a great piece of art because you're in the realm of culture and freedom. And there are some things I think are fantastic, other people don't get it or just think, they think and have good argument for how they're really quite dreadful. Um, but that's because we're free, we're free. And I see things, I don't get it, I, I, I think they're really bad. I, I can admire the professionalism in it. I can, I can admire the artist's strategy in getting them the attention. But I think what it stands for is not a good thing. Because I think what I, I'd like to think that an artist's work, because it is a manifestation of one's higher being. You know, we have a very active lower being, but you can reach one's higher being. I think an artist have this opportunity that you're trying to, so when somebody's looking at it, that will be reflected. So it's not, 
And really the higher being is more common to us all. It's not so individualized. It's, it's something that one can aspire to, that has a moral quality, actually is healthy in the world. And tender. That's something that tends to be absent from a lot of contemporary work now, is, ten, is tenderness, because it gets... Uh, which isn't sentimental, uh, which is... They, they, it's not to be conf confused, but there are some things that are made to be very tough and very aggressive, to be very uncompromising, and quite... Um, something that we, you know, that, that a bit of tenderness would certainly warm it up and make it more available, uh, accessible. This man had a profound effect on these kids. Um, I have never met anybody that, could, that reached that age group as well as he did. And, and it, I think to a large extent it was just through the sheer physicality of, of the way he approached work, the way he you know, uh, uh, without fear. You know, he just he just did it. There was a there was there's a there's a there's a lot of faith in in his approach to to what he makes. He believed. Um, I'm a member of the Eastern Band of Cherokees. It's about an hour and a half from here, over in Cherokee. Uh, um, but the way our people look at sculpture, it has to be this traditional style. And what I've been trying to do is break away from that. Open another market up, open other people's eyes up, that you could actually be a, a Native American and not have to conform to the traditional standards. I mean, you can actually go out and experiment on something new. And over here, I've seen a lot of the different aspects of the art world going on that nobody has to conform to anything. I mean, you're your own person. Be individual. That's basically all it is. Um, Find your own little section of the world and say, this is mine. This is my individual place. This is what I'm going to do. It's, it's a very humbling experience to see somebody like him work and say, well, maybe 25 years from now, I can be maybe on the same level as he is. So it's, it's been a, a very humbling experience on that part. You walk away, the uh, most rewarding part is, is walking away knowing that, that you, know, you just worked with David Nash. You know? um, and... and uh, you're now part of that legacy. Yeah, part, a part of that show, a part of that exhibit. Every time I pick up a piece of wood now, anytime you know, I do anything in wood or, or even you know, pick up a torch, um, start a fire, I think, I think every, every time I do anything um, with, with the wood, with the fire, it's, it's going to bring me back to, to this experience. Um, and, and, and that, that's great, you know, and, and, and I think it's going to continue as time goes on. Um, you know, I, I think that I've learned a lot of things from David that I haven't even realized yet. And I think it's going to take me being in the studio working on my own, on my own work um, to where I can really start drawing in this experience. And his, he, his style, like, he'll, he didn't really mind you know, the technical thing. He's not interested in measuring a perfect square. You know, he feels that, you, you know, the human body from experience and just living on the earth, you know, you, you can go in there and you naturally can cut it. You know, you just cut it and that, the cut's there and you're, you're, what you envision, you know, your body will actually do it. It already knows to kind of. How did that it, affect you? Like, does me? That... Well, this me and putting my, like, my work together. I mean, that's kind of a philosophy I've kind of, you know, in the university there, they want you to get these technical skills and like perfection kind of, you know, it's like they're a lot about perfection and he's just like, like he said, you take his work somewhere and people are like, oh, you know, and like he's just like, that's the feel, you know, it's not, in, it's not, it's not perfect, it's natural, it's like the inherent qualities, he said a lot, the inherent qualities from the wood appear from their natural like, the things we're doing are kind of natural, and he said, "What did he say? The the wood has its own logic, and he's just helping it along, kind of." I don't know. I've been walking through my backyard many a times and seen something that I've completely wanted to expand on, like a grapevine that's going, you know, in a weird direction, and wanted to go back or be out there and do something with it. But I'm always thinking, well, if I want to, I can do it later, you know. But 
just thinking that, well, when I have these ideas, I should act on them. So that's the time to do it. Yeah. Instead of yeah, instead of planning what you're going to do later with it, just do it then, and then there it is, and happen in the moment, kind of, you know. I just thought that too. As the residency drew to a close, this band of artists faced the next major challenge. How to transport more than 40 pieces, weighing some 35,000 pounds, from the backwoods of Pinland to the gallery in Asheville. Monumental wood sculpture requires special handling with industrial strength equipment. The gallery space for the Nash exhibition was rustic and unrefined. The show would be presented in the local artist John Payne's Wedge Gallery on the bank of the French Broad River. The rough concrete and brick walls were coated with silver paint with steel girders overhead. This rustic space provided a creative opportunity for the artist to present this body of work in a unique way to the public. David had surveyed the gallery before the work had begun and had planned the finished pieces with this space in mind. The opening was a spirited event that brought the different groups of students who had worked on the project together for the first time. In similar fashion to the apprentices of the Renaissance, the student artists had contributed to a portion of the work of the master. Now at last, everything came together to visually unfold as a powerful example of the artist's work and his influence on the future of art. The last piece of the exhibition was assembled and charred before the eyes of the attendees. They could witness firsthand the influence of fire, water, and air on the creation of a David Nash sculpture. Well, I think the process has to be considered when you look at the show. Uh, that's the primary thing, that it, it's not just the show and that wasn't the end result wasn't the only concern, that it was four weeks before that and dealing with all the groups of students before that making them at Penland, um, and engaging with the students. Pieces changed. Some of the pieces were developed just so that they would be able to engage with the material. The last group was going to get shafted, basically, because they were going to be stuck doing just installation and moving and finishing work. And they got to make this piece for more hands-on. Um, and they did a branding piece. So that changed. It evolved. He's, he reacts constantly. So there's no set plan. I mean, he'll have a, a motive. And, and it evolves. And I think that this show is indicative of that. Uh, well, it's loose and tight. You see, it's don't... I th if I keep my mind on the process of making and keep that clean and evolving and spontaneous, the object will look after itself. The uh, aesthetics are born out of the m medium and the way of working and my inherent qualities myself. That's the combination. Um, some artists are well known and they disappear. Some artists aren't known and then, then they appear after their, after their death. I, I don't really know. I think I'd like to be remembered as somebody who was deeply connected with the environmental movement and the awareness that we need to look after our resources. Um, someone who genuinely connected with the elemental forces, to, you know, which is a much healthier way of doing things. The Nash Residency was a powerful educational experience for the students who worked side by side with this great artist. It became obvious that David went out of his way to connect with each student. And for those who were sensitive to what was happening around him and open to learning, their lives were changed. The students came to realize that art is a process that never stops. It relies on the magic of discovering the masterpieces within ourselves and embraces the joy of sharing our discovery with others. We are, as David states, social beings with a need to connect with others. Art only becomes real when it is shown. We are intertwined with nature in a continuum that progresses long after the artist is gone. The exhibition of what we have made during our time on Earth takes the form of tangible images and objects that often reveal the inner truths about ourselves, our society, and our world. And in the end, 
as it has been written, it is the truth that shall set us free.